Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, today we're going to continue with another chapter four, but now we continue with the heat transfer part of the work, which is in Sengel and Gajar. So for the rest of the course, we're going to use Sengel and Gajar. We start with chapter four. Why? Because you've already done the first three chapters in the previous course, thermoflow or the fluid mechanics part of the course. So that is the conduction heat transfer part. So today we start with transient heat conduction and the overview of the chapter is that firstly it is about lumped systems, then transient heat conduction in large plane walls, long cylinders and spheres with spatial effects, then paragraph 4.3 is the transient heat conduction in semi-infinite solids and then the last part transient heat conduction in multi-dimensional systems. So that's an overview of the chapter what we're going to do for the rest for the next week or so. So let's start with what do we mean with transient heat conduction? Okay. Transient heat conduction if we look at a body and any arbitrary body and we look at different positions in that body let's say position one two and three and we measure the temperatures as a function of time okay we measure the temperatures as function of time so if we measure the temperature there all the time then the temperature might change something like that and we might be interested in the temperature after one minute so transient heat conduction is about changes in temperature as a function of time this point two its initial temperature might be there okay so that might be how position two behaves position three might be something like that and position four here on the surface might have a different initial temperature and we might be interested in how the temperature changes as a function of time so in general we can say it is about the temperature field if we choose a Cartesian coordinate system a temperature field in terms of different positions x y and z and we want to determine how those temperatures change as a function of time a good approach would be to say let's have a very fundamental approach to solving any arbitrary body okay. so fundamental approach and if we have a very fundamental approach we would say well let's start with the energy equation the energy equation okay, and the energy equation we've derived in the previous chapter the differential one and, it's look, and it looks like this rho multiplied by d u hat dt uh, not partial uh, normal dt's plus the pressure multiplied by the grot of the velocity vector plus the grot of k grot t plus the viscous dissipation function okay and this viscous dissipation function is a long equation it is something like the viscosity mu multiplied by partial uh, by two times partial du dx square plus several other terms that is the energy equation okay. now what we would like to have is a Nobel Prize winner that can solve that equation for us so that we can have an equation x y z t which looks like something like this a constant multiplied by x squared multiplied by y plus b multiplied by x z multiplied by t etc 
that is what we would like to have. A general equation that is the solution of the energy equation. Up to now it hasn't happened yet that somebody could derive that equation for us. So, <coughs> so there's no general solution. Okay. So because there's no general solution, we've got two options. We've got an option in terms of solving the problem numerically using CFD, computational fluid dynamics, and you're going to do a full course on that. And or we can make certain approximations which in some cases might be exact solutions or close to exact solutions and in some cases the approximations might not be that good but it is still necessary to do this work to understand it because you can't go and solve everything with CFD and even if you do you need to check if your solution is correct or not. Okay. Okay. So as I've mentioned, in this chapter there are going to be four different approaches of solving transient heat conduction problems. The first one in paragraph 4.1 is the lump system approach. Okay, the lump system approach. The second approach is to look at long cylinders, walls, and spheres. Okay. So in terms of geometry, quite simple geometries that we can solve. The third class of problems is going to be semi-infinite solids. What is a semi-infinite solid? That would be a very big body maybe like the moon, okay. temperature suddenly changes around the moon and we want to determine the temperature underneath the surface 10 millimeters or 15 millimeters underneath the surface. So that type of body we can also solve quite well with an analytical solution. Okay, and the 4.4 4 is multi-bodies or multi-dimensional bodies multi-dimensional. <coughs> okay. So that is just how everything fits together and what we're going to do is we're going to start with the most simplest approach and making it more complicated and more difficult. So we start very very simple. Paragraph 4.1 is the lump system approach. So let's start with the lump system approach. Lump system approach. Now that would be for bodies that behave like a lump. Now what is a lump? A lump in Afrikaans is a klont. So it's a... This would be a lump body. It would be something with all the masses together. Okay, a lump system. Lump system. Now let, let's look at a few examples so that we can understand what we mean with a lump system. Okay. Let's consider a small copper ball. small copper ball and this small copper ball there it is small copper ball and it is in an oven okay now I say it is small that is very important okay so if we enlarge it and it looks like that okay an enlargement of that ball and we are interested in positions one two and maybe three okay. and this copper ball has been in the oven maybe at 100 degrees Celsius for a very long time okay. if we take it now out of the oven okay. so we take it out of the oven where the environment temperature is 20 degrees Celsius <coughs> Then if we look at the temperature behavior of this small copper ball, the temperature as a function of time, 
If we would go and measure the temperatures there while it was in the oven. Okay, so that is in the oven and that is out of the oven. At time equals zero. Okay. Arbitrary time equals zero. <coughs> while the small copper ball was in the oven, if I would measure the temperature at point one, then that would be typically what we're going to measure. The temperature would remain constant. If I would measure it at point two, it would be the same. The two lines, and also by point, at point three, all three of the lines would lie on top of each other. So you can go and plot them at different colors. Okay, maybe line two is in green, and line three is in red. They're lying on top of each other, all three of them. Okay, there you are. If we take them out of the oven, the temperature at point one is going to decrease, typically like that. If we measure the temperature at point two and point three, it would follow the same line, approximately. Follow the same line. Okay. So what can we say? We can say for this class of problem, for this class of problem, the temperature that we are interested in as a function of position and time. Okay. We can say it doesn't vary as a function of time. As a function of position. It only varies as a function of temperature. So if we say temperature as a function of x, y, z, then it's no. <coughs> if the temperature a function of time is yes. Okay. And this would mean it is a lumped system. It's a system in which there are no temperature gradients on the inside. There are no temperature gradients. The temperatures all remain constant. Okay. Let's look at the opposite type of problem. The opposite type of problem is a big rump steak. And very thick, okay, very thick, very thick ram steak. Okay. And there's position one, a measuring point two and measuring point three. And this big ram steak is at a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. It was lying in the kitchen for a few hours. Okay. Now you put it in the oven. Put it in the oven. There it is. And again, we are interested in positions one, two, and three. And the oven is at a temperature of 180 degrees Celsius. Now again, let's plot the temperature as a function of time. Temperature as a function of time. Let's say that is out of the out of the oven, that is inside the oven. Outside the oven and inside the oven. <coughs> if we've measured the temperature when the steak was out of the oven, then the temperature would be 20 degrees Celsius for point one, and it would be the same for points two and three. So all three, the colors of the lines, are lying on top of each other. There's no temperature variation. Okay. Now we put it inside the oven. What happens on the surface? The surface temperature increases. Okay. It would increase. Point two would be there in the center. 
that is going to do something like that and point 3 is well it's not too far from the surface so the temperature in point 3 would be doing something like that okay so if we now look at the temperature distribution inside the body we are interested in and we look at T as a function of X Y Z and T then we cannot say that the temperature is a constant inside the body okay you agree because it's a function of X Y and Z okay and that the result of that would be to say this is not a lump system not a lump system now these were examples that we all know but there might be many other bodies in many other different circumstances where we do not have a practical feeling in terms of how are they going to behave are they going to behave like a lump system or not okay. in terms of how to define that and how to determine that we will get to that a little bit later okay. so it is important that we need a criteria we need a criteria a mathematical criteria that we can use so that we can determine if a body is a lump system or if it is not a lump system but at this stage what is important to know for you is that in a lump system in a lump system we would say that the temperatures inside the body are all the same in a non lump system there would be a temperature gradient and therefore it would not be able to use this approach okay let's start with the derivation of an equation which is the lump system equation and that starts with considering a body an arbitrary body okay. and this arbitrary body has a mass m it has a volume v remember that v is the volume it is not velocity density a cp and the body is at a uniform temperature ti the initial temperature ti the temperature everywhere inside the body is constant on the outside we have the surface of the body as and we've got the environment temperature t in t infinite and there's a heat transfer coefficient on the outside h an assumption of course is that this heat transfer coefficient is the same everywhere around the body okay so we are making assumptions here okay now at t equals zero at t equals zero this body is being put into this environment where the temperature is t infinite okay so firstly we've got the body with that mass volume density and cp and the temperature is constant inside the body and at time equals zero we put it in an environment where the temperature is t infinite and there's an heat transfer coefficient h okay so what we're going to say then is that the heat transfer into the body during the time dt the heat transfer into the body during time dt is equal to the increase in energy in energy during dt Now the heat transfer into the body dt is equal to the heat transfer coefficient 
multiplied by the surface, multiplied by the temperature gradient. The temperature difference, T infinite minus T. Now we're going to assume T infinite is higher than T. Ti is the initial temperature, while T would obviously be the temperature at any moment in time. Okay. So the heat transfer into the body over a time period dT is equal to the heat transfer rate, which is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area, multiplied by the temperature difference, which is T infinite minus T. At t equals zero, at t equals zero, it would obviously be t infinite minus t i, but in general, it would be t infinite minus the temperature t. Okay, it's equal to the increase in energy, which is equal to m c p d t. Oops, and I forgot to put in something here. And that is to multiply it by dt. I'm going to explain it to you just now. That is equal to m c p dt. So what we're looking at now is the amount of energy dt. So that might be over three seconds. The heat transfer rate in watts multiplied by the time is the joules. The amount of heat transfer m c p dt. Okay. Now the mass is equal to the density multiplied by the volume. The mass is equal to the density multiplied by the volume. And we can say in general that dt would be equal to d multiplied by t minus t infinite. Why? Because that is a constant. In terms of the differentiation, then that term is going to disappear in any case. And you're going to see why I'm doing that a little bit later. Okay. So if we do the substitution, we can say it is the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area, multiplied by T infinite minus T, dT, is equal to rho multiplied by the volume Cp multiplied by D, T minus T infinite. Okay. Now I would like to have all the temperatures together. Here's the temperatures and there's the temperature. Okay. So I'm going to write it as D multiplied by T minus T infinite divided by T infinite minus T is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area divided by rho multiplied by the volume and Cp multiplied by dt. Okay. So I've kept this temperature here, I've divided by this one and I've moved all the other terms to the other side. Okay. Now if I look at this I would like to have t minus t infinite here for the integration. Okay. So to do that I have to divide by minus 1. If I divide by minus 1 then I can write this as d t minus t infinite divided by t infinite minus time is equal to minus the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area divided by the density, the volume, and Cp dt. Okay. okay, this term is like dx divided by x. Okay, it's the similar as dx divided by x. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, I've divided by minus 1, so those two terms must just switch around. And here we've got the minus. Okay. So in terms of integrating it, if we do the integration, we can say that when t is equal to 0, when time is equal to 0, the temperature of the body is equal to Ti, the initial temperature. When T is equal to zero, the body is at Ti, the initial temperature. Okay. Then when T is equal to T, then we would like to know what the temperature is going to be. So that is T as a function of temperature. Are you happy with that? Okay. So if we do the integration, then this term is the limb of t minus t infinite between the boundaries ti and the temperature as a function of t is equal to minus all a constant h multiplied by the area divided by the density, the volume and cp and this one is just equal to t if I do the integration and it's between the boundary conditions of 0 and t. Do the substitution. It's the limb of the temperature minus T infinite minus the limb of Ti minus T infinite is equal to minus the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area divided by the density, the volume and Cp multiplied by time and doing it for the other term would give us zero. Okay. This we can write as the limb of the temperature as a function of time minus T infinite divided by Ti minus T infinite is equal to minus the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area rho the volume Cp multiplied by T. If we want to get rid of the Lin term, we have to take the exponential of it, we take the E exponential of it, then we can get the temperature the temperature term is then equal to E to minus BT where B is then equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area, rho, the volume, and Cp. So that's not a, just, that is just a time constant. So in terms of if we look at this solution, what do we have here? We have this term, which are all the temperatures all together. But what it is, is actually the non-dimensionalized time. The non-dimensionalized time. And you're going to see in this course, in many cases we are going to write things in a non-dimensionalized form. It's non-dimensionalized temperature. And if we look at this, the characteristics of that term. Okay. If we have a body which is at the temperature Ti, okay, and the environment suddenly changed to T infinite. Okay, remember it was Ti, and then at T equals zero it changes to T infinite. Okay. So 
let's suppose there is T infinite. And that is Ti. Okay. At T equals zero, it changes. So if we look at the typical characteristics of the temperature as a function of time, then we've got this exponential type of characteristic that we're going to have in our body. And depending on the value of B, depending on the value of B, it might be something like that or it might be something like that. All of them changes very quickly at the beginning and then depending on how large the value B is in terms of the rest of the characteristics. So if we look at different values of B, if we call that B1, that one B2 and B3, then in general B3 would be larger than B2 would be larger than B1. So the larger the value of B, the more quickly it would approach T infinite. Okay. How can we make B large? What will make it large? What will make it large is a high heat transfer coefficient, a big surface area, low density, a small volume and a small CP. So those are the things that is going to determine if B is going to be small or large. Okay. So in general we can see that B is directly proportional to the heat transfer coefficient of the area and indirectly proportional to the density, the volume and the CP. Again, if we plot the temperature as a function of time, that is T infinite, and that is Ti, and let's suppose that is our characteristic. In general, in heat transfer, we are very interested in the heat transfer rate. We want to know how many, how many watts or kilowatts or megawatts has been transferred. Okay. In unsteady heat transfer, it is a little bit difficult because it is now a function of time. So if we at any specific time is interested in the heat transfer rate, then the heat transfer rate then the heat transfer rate is equal to going to be equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area multiplied by the temperature at that time the temperature at that time minus t infinite if we are interested in the heat transfer rate The heat transfer, HT, I'm going to use this a lot in the course, the heat transfer rate. Heat transfer rate. But because the heat transfer rate changes as a function of time, in many cases in unsteady heat transfer, in unsteady heat transfer studies, we are interested in the amount of heat transfer, which is different than the heat transfer rate. So the amount of heat transfer, take note, not the heat transfer rate, the amount of heat transfer. So if we look at the amount of heat transfer, again, the temperature as a function of time, there is T infinite, that is the behavior, and that is Ti, and that is the temperature at T, at time T, then the amount of heat transfer rate would be proportional to that area there. Okay. The amount of heat transfer. So the amount of heat transfer, take note, not Q dot, 
just Q. Here it was the heat transfer rate. Now it is the amount of heat transfer. The amount of heat transfer is going to be MCP multiplied by the temperature minus Ti. And that is in joules. Now in many cases we would be interested in knowing the average amount of or the average heat transfer rate. Okay. So the average heat transfer rate okay, the average heat transfer rate would then be the amount of heat transfer would be the amount divided by delta T. Which means that if we look at delta T, that would give us approximately that area there. So that is equal to M Cp, the temperature minus Ti, divided by delta T. The units will now be in watts. So that would be for delta T there. <laughs> and then in your textbook you will also see the so-called maximum heat transfer. I would rather prefer to call it the total heat transfer. The total heat transfer total heat transfer would be, if we look at the temperature as a function of time, that is T infinite, and we start with the temperature Ti, those two temperatures are no, never going to be exactly the same, but at a stage, as an engineer, it would be very difficult for you to measure temperature differences smaller than 0.1. So if you might use temperature difference as equal to 0.1, you will be able to determine what I would rather call the total. The total heat transfer rate is then equal to MCP multiplied by T infinite minus Ti and the units would be in joules. Take note, in the textbook of Sengel and Gajar, they call this the maximum. I would prefer not to use, to use it the maximum, but I would prefer to say it is the total amount of heat transfer. Right, now we have to get to that characteristic length, or the, sorry, not the characteristic length, the criteria. We said that if we look at bodies, then there are two different types. Obviously the type that we can say it is a lump system and the others which are not a lump system. And we need the criteria for that. So in terms of the criteria for a lump system, <coughs> the first thing that we need to do is to define a characteristic length we need to define a characteristic length. And this always happens in thermal flow, in fluid mechanics and heat transfer. If you want to determine the Reynolds number, you need to have a characteristic length. If it's a tube, then you would say it's the diameter of the tube. But it might be a car, then it's the length of the car. So characteristic length is very, very important. So the characteristic length is going to be LC, and in general, it's going to be the volume divided by the surface area. And this is for an arbitrary body. Okay. 
very simple definition, but when you're going to get to the next part of the work, many students are going to be confused. Okay. And the reason for that is, underneath this part in your textbook where this characteristic length is defined, there's a paragraph saying that in some cases, in other cases, this is not how you calculate it. Okay. And what it says is that there's a, let's call it a however. There's an however. And the however is firstly for what is called a large plane wall of thickness 2L. So there is 2L, there's the large plane wall, something like that. Okay. That's the first however. The second one is for a long cylinder. For a long cylinder with a radius of R0. A long cylinder with a radius of R0. That's the second one. And the third one is for a sphere. And the sphere also has a radius of R0. Now in these cases, the characteristic length is equal to L. In this case, it's equal to R0 divided by 2. The radius divided by 2. And for this case, it is going to be the radius divided by 3. If you've got a highlighter or a red pen or whatever in your textbook, you need to highlight that. So many students miss that. Okay. Now, once we've got the criteria, what we're going to use to determine if something is a good lump system approach or not is the so-called BIOT number. The BIOT number is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the characteristic length divided by the thermal conductivity K. Okay. Now where does this number come from, the build number? Well it comes from, if I write it in a little bit other, in a little other format, I multiply by delta T, the top term, and the bottom one I write like this, K divided by L multiplied by delta T. Then we can see the build number is the ratio of, it is the ratio of Conduction HT is heat transfer. It's the ratio of con oh, sorry convection heat transfer. Convection heat transfer divided by conduction heat transfer. Okay. It's the ratio of Convection heat transfer divided by conduction heat transfer. Now heat transfer, in the previous chapters, you've seen the heat transfer rate is equal to delta T divided by a resistance. Okay, do you remember that? Divided by a resistance. And because it is indirectly proportional to the resistance, it means the build number is actually the radio, the ratio of the conduction resistance divided by the convection resistance. It's the conduction resistance divided by the convection resistance. And these two resistance terms are for the body inside and outside. So what we have is that on the outside 
we've got T infinite okay, with its convection resistance. <coughs> resistance of convection. And inside the body we've got the resistance of conduction. Okay. And the convection resistance the convection resistance is directly proportional to one divided by the heat transfer coefficient. And this one, the conduction one, is directly proportional to the characteristic length divided by the thermal conductivity. Okay. So the build number gives us the ratio of these two resistances. Okay. Now what is important is that the lump system is exact if the build number is equal to zero. If the build number is equal to zero then the lump system approach would give us an exact solution. Okay. If it is approximate it will give us approximate solutions if the build number is larger than zero then it would give us an approximate and it would give us a, an applicable or a good answer if the build number is typically smaller or equal to 0.1 okay. so the build number tells us if we can use a lump system or not when will it be equal to zero? Well, never. Okay. Never in practice. Okay. When will it be larger than zero? If you look at that, nothing is smaller than zero, so it will always, it will always be larger than zero. So we can always use it to give us an approximate solution. An approximate solution. But sometimes the build number would be smaller than 0.1. Then would, it would give us a very good answer. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that was the build number. And thank you very much, and I'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.